Greetings, film freaks. We are the Podcorn Kernels. Join us as we discuss the hard and often indigestible truths that are at the center of the fluffy and delicious world of cinema. Season 2. What's poppin' people? Welcome to the Podcorn Kernels podcast. My name is Adam and joining me in your ear holes is Harry. Say hello, Harry. Have you been woken up in the middle of the night with an erection and not knowing how it got there? Well, don't just assume you're healthy and sexually charged. You may have been raped by a ghost. For just $60 a month, we can smell your bed sheets for you and determine from spiritual spew what post-life criminal had his way with you. We are the Nutbusters. On today's episode, we will be talking about All of Us Strangers. This is a 2023 film directed by Andrew Haig and stars Andrew Scott, Paul Mescal and Jamie Bell. IMDb describes the synopsis as follows. A screenwriter drawn back to his childhood home enters into a fledgling relationship with his downstairs neighbour while discovering a mysterious new way to heal from losing his parents 30 years ago. Here is an original song to support the synopsis. What is grief, if not love persevering, remembering you is what keeps me healing. What is grief, if not love persevering, remembering you is what keeps me healing. When I'm all alone, with no one by my side. Let's start with some facts about the film. Andrew Haig's childhood home served as the filming location for the house Adam finds his parents in. 151. You clocked that. You remembered that, dog. I did, because I was going to suggest to you that we drive there yesterday and just look at the house. But I should imagine there's quite a lot of people doing that now. But I can also imagine some poor fuckers live in there. And every day they just look out the window and they just see gormless people staring into their home taking selfies with it if that was my home i'd be charging i'd be like you can have a fucking tour come on in yeah it's true five pound ten pound a pop it could become like quite a famous dogging site oh couldn't it if you're into films and you're into dogging and you're like this is where they filmed all of us strangers oh let's do it i'd say it's not peak dogging territory because no. it's in a residential area on on the street house to ponder house yeah right next to so unless you're like a a really confident dogger and you want an audience maybe that's where you go and do your dogging ghillie suit dogging camouflage into the bush you would stand out even more in a residential area with ghillie do ghillie do ghillie suit ghillie suit dogging ghillie dudes ghillie dudes yeah yeah i just think i think that's a lovely little fact because when it's a story focused on evoking sort of emotions nostalgia 
what a better place to do it than a familiar place like your childhood home everyone everyone remembers their first home there's mm. a lot of happy memories in your first home for a lot of people probably some sad memories as well but in this film when you're asking the lead character to revisit the fact that the director uses his own home i think it can i just i don't know something about that feels like it adds up to to make a better product if they if it's if it's relatable to at least someone working within the film they go oh i had this feeling here and then the actor can pull on that and they can have that sort of shared experience by being at a, a place of of memory i love location filming if you can avoid using a sound stage you should mm. the, the technology you have nowadays you can get a small enough camera a little bit of a sound guy in the, in a house and you can do an entire film in a house i love that very avant-garde would you be down for a film crew coming to your house and go, oh, someone wants to shoot because this this house has some significance to the director? Would you be down for it? Would you be a bit like, show me the money? I wouldn't ask for money. I'd ask for an in. Oh, yeah. I'd ask for some sort of way to get into that industry. You come into my house. I come into every film you ever make. Yeah, or bring me on as some sort of writer or tea boy just so I can be in the industry. That's smart. I'd like that. Yeah. yeah. All of Us Strangers is loosely adapted from the novel Strangers by Taichi Yamada, a book which also inspired the 1988 film The Discarnates. It's different though, isn't it? There's this film, it's inspired by it, but I think the Japanese one is much more ghoulish, much more ghostly. Yeah. I, th I think it is, yeah. I think it's, they love the supernatural yeah. in, in their horror films and stuff. I do think from reading a little bit about it that it was a lot more, uh, a lot more eccentric, a lot more eccentric, a lot more supernatural. Would you be interested in reading the novel Strangers and viewing the film The Discarnates? I don't know. You can only be down so much. After watching this film, I don't know if I'd go into that book like so excited to read this book. Yeah, it's a bit of a Debbie Downer, isn't it? That's like ticking off the days for a funeral. Yeah, it's worth saying there's a lot of, I find there's a lot of beauty within the film, but I can't sit here and say it's not bleak as fuck. There's mm. a lot of depressing elements within this film. I'd be more interested in, in watching the film that inspired The Discarnates, purely because I know nothing about it. And I, write, I prefer films to books because they're easier to digest quicker to consume so for that reason alone i think i'd if i had to dig into one of them it'd be the discarnates no nothing about it though it wouldn't be on my on my immediate watch list no not high on your priority list no you after a film like this you do need something a little lighter don't you for yes sure. something a little sweeter yeah yes jamie bell the actor who plays adam's father is actually 10 years younger than andrew scott in real life mm -hmm. and claire foy who portrays the mother is eight years younger than scott mm. Now, when I first saw the casting for this, before I watched the film, before I read the synopsis, I was a bit confused at who Jamie Bell and Claire Foy were going to be within this. Mm. Then when I found out that it was um, Andrew Scott's parents, I was like, no, that can't work because Andrew Scott surely is a lot older. Yes. When in fact it works so well because it shows mm. you that him looking back on his parents, they were younger than he is now when he lost them. And it makes that sort of connection feel a lot more raw. Andrew Scott in this film plays Adam. He's a lost man. He's gone through a hell of a lot in his life. And he finds a way to connect with his parents that are no longer with, with him. And the fact that they are younger than him when he revisits them, he's now almost oddly the parent because he's lived more life than his parents have lived. Yeah, and he's filling them in. Yeah, it's it's mad, but it's beautifully handled. Because I didn't know very much about the film. All I knew was that it's uh, it's based on a homosexual guy and he's going through some sort of loss or grief. Now, when the film starts, I assumed that he was grieving over a lost lover. And mm. I thought Jamie Bell was said lost lover. Because when he retrieves him from the football field and takes him to the house, there's just something about Jamie Bell's character, the way he touches Adam's hand and... The way he quickly says, oh, none of that poof stuff. Like, yeah. I, th I thought he's a closeted gay. Uh, they were in love and he died. And I thought Paul Mescal was the new love interest. Yeah. And then it clicked. I was like, oh my God, it's his mum and dad. It's it's clever how it does that because, as I say, like uh, Jamie Bell is clearly younger than Andrew Scott. So if you don't know that going in, you're going to assume well, they're, they're lovers or they're friends, they're acquaintances, they're, they're something to each other because mm. of that familiarity when they, they meet. 
but the fact that he is younger is certainly something I, I haven't seen in a film before. No. A child visit their parent when they're older than their parents. Mm. Yeah, it was a weird one, but I really appreciate it. Cutting as well, how they interlace some of the shots in reflections. He's a little boy. Mm. Oh, Clever, isn't it? Oi. Yeah, I don't know about you, but there's large parts of this film that made me feel a lot of feelings. Yes, definitely. And I sometimes struggle to feel a I lot shed, of feelings. I shed tears. I did shed tears because it was perfectly executed yeah having myself recently been witness to family loss it was like wow this speaks to that more than anything i've really seen it was fierce heavy hitting huh heavy hitting should we try and perk it up a bit by going into your likes we can try yes firstly i'm just going to cover probably what my favorite fact today is on the popcorn kernels and uh, here's some of the lines to support that oh this is the southern service to East Grinstead, days out at the Whitgift Centre. What am I going to do in Dorking? So these are some of the geographic locations mentioned in the film. Now, for you listeners, and if you're interested, Dorking is a market town 15 minutes from me and Adam. The Whitgift Centre is a mall in a town called Croydon, which I frequented many times as a child. And London is just a 35-minute train from us here. The characters are called Harry and Adam. Mm. If you want to see our surroundings in our day-to-day, watch this film because we've been on them trains, walked those streets, yeah. smelt those smells. Yeah, This film is so close to home as any of I've, I've ever seen. And if, if me and Adam were homosexual, this film would be almost an impossible coincidence. Yeah, I would be checking my home for bugs and cameras. Yeah. Yeah. The the What feels like the only difference with the our lives and the film is the, the sexuality and the parents when you were watching it did you watch did you watch it as paul mescal as me because i watched i watched it as scott as you i watched it as scott as me but that probably says how self-involved i am yeah so i watched it as scott as you so when in their scenes i was like i'd, I'd flicker in and imagine it was me and you oh i don't know i wasn't like aroused i was just saying like oh, that's a damn shame it will I was just saying, it was like, you imagine sometimes you put people in the shoes of the characters you're watching. I mean... And it's it's hard not to. I mean, it's Adam and Harry and it's set near Dorking. We're 15 minutes away from, well, some of it is. We we occasionally go drinking in Dorking. We do. I was was in fucking Dorking at the weekend. I've been on the train he was on that's heading to East Grinstead. When I used to live in Gatwick Hawley, you get London, the Gatwick Express, 30 minutes. I've been on that train. Yeah. Like you said, the levels of relatability in this one Mm. is a little bit like wait hang on and And, the the loss of two parents is also a very recent coincidence I'm just like it's freaked me out yeah freaked me out I do think on a very simple pure boy level the fact that everyone was talking to or at Adam within the film I was sitting there and a lot of times I'm like why are they talking to me like that Mm. when I heard East Grinstead I was like I've been on that train I know that train weird Whitgift Centre I've been there many times Croydon yeah. is a shithole, but I've been there loads of times. But that was the, they're they're talking to the Whitgift when it was the seventies, I think. I bet it was banging back then. Yeah, it would have been. Well, that's your vibes. That's why he's got nostalgia for it, yeah. like the American restaurant and stuff, and and the toy shops. Like it's just it's sort of a it's a really weird film for us to watch, and it is a like it. So I would advise if you ever want to see the sort of surroundings we live in and the areas we come from, if you want to see through our eyes, this watch this film. Yeah. If you like the taste of our jam and you're in the States and you always wanted to know where the fruit comes from, then watch All of Us Strangers and you'll be like, ha, huh, that's where the material is sourced because it is very close to home. Like, forget the names. Like, the, the names could be set anywhere, but the the immediate surrounding area, like, ev- everything is just a bit like, ooh. And I'm not saying it's beautiful. It's not at all. And uh, but I do, what I do dislike as well though, is a lot of people, internationals, believe England to be a rainy, grey, bleak place. It's not. You need to you need to branch out of London. There are some stunning places in England. Yeah. Cornwall is our French Riviera. It's got turquoise blue waters. It oh, is beautiful. stunning. The seafood yeah. is insane. The Lake District is like something out of Braveheart. We have many beautiful places. London is just not one of them. Yes. Second like, the scenes where he takes the train to Memory Lane to play out a spectral imaginary form of closure with his deceased parents. I mean, wow. Mm. Powerful moments. In my opinion, it's the strongest aspect of the film. His interactions with his ghostly parents, especially Jamie Bell's acceptance and warmth towards his son, who, whilst he was alive, never would have really known if his son was homosexual. Mm. The scenes with him and his dad, 
where his dad doesn't give an absolute toss. Well, he he says he always knew and it never bothered him, didn't he? Oh, it's cutting. Like yeah. the Jamie Bell's got contacts in this, dark ones. That gives him a bit more age, but it also changed changed him almost as an actor for me. Yeah, up until this point, I see Jamie Bell, I see Billy Elliot. Which was fantastic, Yeah, but that was a long time ago. Yeah, it was the a, Gilbert Grape of the decap. Yeah, he's a fully grown man now, so to see him play an older gentleman, a father figure... Yeah, I mean, so well. Yeah. Oh, really cut deep. Mm. Really cut deep. Had a lot of friends and old teachers that were homosexual and would talk to them sometimes about what it was like to hide that from your parents and stuff. And it really, I think that's why it got me emotional because I've never had to have that. Yeah. I've never, I've never had to hide who I was. And it's just, I think that acceptance from a dad, because that's usually the stereotype, isn't it? That the dad disowns the son if he's gay. Yeah. Seeing him accept him and love him even more, that was exceptional. And the dad is is from a time, from an era when it wasn't accepted, where it was it was taboo. Like the Claire Foy's character, the mum in this, really reacts quite badly to it. And that's a good point you make. Like as much as we can relate to this film because of the character names, because of the locations, because of the nostalgia, because of all these things. I spoke to someone that I I communicate with regularly on on Instagram. And he was saying the the depiction of gay isolation and gay loneliness within the film, he said that's something that he really strongly connected with. Mm. And that offered an, a fascinating perspective that, like you said, me, me and you are fortunate enough we've never had to hide who we are. We Even in the school days, you know, like they make a point in the film, gay used to be like, the, the term gay mm. used to be used to, to say something that's in gay. a negative sense. Yeah. So hearing that extra layer from someone who can connect to that sort of queer isolation mm. it, it, it added more layers to a already very layered film well Haig said he wanted Andrew Scott because he can actually totally relate to the experience he said but he's not like like I, I think only gays should be casted as gays only straight should be casted as straights mm. etc or heterosexuals so that's why the mascal aspect wasn't it wasn't relevant they say yeah, they even you know they stand by the mas- mascal is it mascal or mescal mescal i think he, he's casting they stand by it because andrew scott who was the lead in it and he he gives you the direct connection to the experience that's yeah. why his performance is so almost flawed it, well didn't need to do it it was real probably yeah. it, was, it was a natural performance because he he related to it highly and i thought that was exceptional and that bleeds through doesn't it that relatability mm. like p- pulling on on real experiences and those feelings of, of unique isolation i think i mean we all experience that's the isolation word. isolation is the word we i all, didn't have a word for this that's the word we all experience it in one form or another but that isolation is different from our isolation than it would be to a young gay person growing up because mm. of societal expectations or the struggle faced with with having to come out and, and all that comes with it. Well, you're told all your life that, oh, this is a square and that's what we've got to fit you in. Mm. This is the box you're, you're going to go in. But you, you feel like a triangle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, that, and it's like, how do I tell them I don't want to go in the square? Yeah. Because I don't think I fit in that square. Exactly that, yeah. And that, And it... Paul Mescal's character talks about it in the, uh, sorry, Harry talks about it in the film as well, about how he's on the edge of his family. Mm. There's a nucleus of their natural, predetermined, stereotypical process of being in a family. You, you have kids, you have a marriage, or you bought a new car. Like he's on the fringe of that. Yeah. Can't really get in. It's yeah. like the sperm not being able to penetrate the egg. Yeah. yeah. Third like, realistic jizz. Oh. What did they use? And please tell me it's synthetic. I mean... It's not short bus, is it? I have a few points. First one being, I didn't know it was going to go there. Mm-hmm. Second, I have no idea what they used. I don't know if there's a, a prop just, just guy. specialist. Yeah, a prop guy, a pop prop guy. Like, <laughs> I have no idea. Oh, what a what a thing to put on your CV. Specialize in the recreation yeah. of seminal fluid. I am a synthetic sperm specialist. Synthetic tuna meat. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, I, I don't know. Isn't that amazing, though? Didn't it look real? Yeah, yeah. I can't say it didn't. I mean, the glimmer from the moon oh. hitting it off of uh, Scott's chest. My eye went straight to it. It happens. So they they start getting it on, and then it sort of cuts, and obviously, fate complete. It's finished. It's, it's the job done. But there's a glimmer on the chest, and my eye went straight to it, and I was like, "What that are?" And I was like, "That looked real. I, that looks real." 
I do love that in a podcast where we were attempting to be profound, we were profound. and understand, uh, understanding all these things, and then boom, that cum looks real. Mm. I mean, <laughs> and the fact you like that, that cum, that you weren't sitting there going, I tell you what, this film was exceptional, but that man milk fake. Well, if it looked like cornflour, I'd be dissing it for the uh, not being realistic, wouldn't I? I mean, to build to build on your point, it has to be edible because mescal laps it up. So uh, whatever it is, it's got to be able to digest. Maybe some sh- uh, maybe some sort of sugary glu- uh, glucose water sort of thing going yep. on. Yeah, we could try and recreate it. I, Synthetically. I was a baker for several years ah. at a supermarket chain and we had hot cross paste oh. <laughs> that you would use to cross hot cross buns. That's it. That's it. That It didn't look quite like that. But if that hot cross paste started to get a little bit close to the best before date, it did go a little bit translucent. So maybe, <sighs> maybe it's hot cross bun paste. And if any listener out there knows the identity of the synthetic seminal fluid the non-nut, yes. then please do get in touch. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's the first time we've ever done that, but that was yeah. I think that was a really valid point. Yeah, I do as well. N- another like, Jamie Bell, you all sort of cover this, Jamie Bell, 38, Claire Foy, 40, Andrew Scott, 47. So whether it through high quality performance or just heart-wrenching writing, I truly saw them as his parents in situ from the time of their death. Yeah. Uh, ex- exceptional scenes of Jamie Bell and Scott brought tears to my eyes. Uh, I definitely, I just, I saw him as his dad. Yeah, I, t- I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, each, you know, it's, it's, there's pa- basically only four cast members in this and each one of them I always had down as, oh, they're, they're decent. They're good actors. Yeah, they're good people, good actors. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, Andrew Scott, he's charming. Uh, Paul Mescal, he's up and coming. Jamie Bell, he's good. Claire Foy, I've liked her, what I've seen in. After this film, I'm like, oh, they are very good. Mm. Before I was like, oh, I know, they're decent enough. And there was no one on that that short cast list where I was like, oh, fuck's sake, he or she's in this arc. Oh, I want to watch this. Each one, I'm like, oh, they're, they're good. After this, I'm like, oh, they are very good. Mm. And I think that speaks to the power of the writing, the power of the performance, the, the power believability, of love. the power of love. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, if that's in a film, that bumps the score up as well. Yeah, that's a, a top 10 song of all time as far as I'm concerned. Greatest Christmas song up there with Chris DeBurr. Mm. Spaceman Come Travelling or something. I don't know, man. All right, bro. Calm down. I gone to my likes? Yes. So the big one, Andrew Scott. Mr. Scott puts in a profound and powerful performance as a writer trying to heal. And I thought his turn as Adam deserved an Academy Award nomination. What starts off as an awkward, quiet character soon transforms into one that becomes desperate to come to terms with his grief. Now, I've, I just mentioned it. I've always thought Andrew Scott had great charm, but after seeing this, I'm convinced it's a matter of time until he wins recognition in the form of a golden statuette. Mm-hmm. Now, his performance in this is so nuanced. It's so layered. It starts off, and I think I can re- I can relate to that awkward Adam that you see at the start of the film, like really sort of shying away from company, uh, hides away, sort of keeps himself to himself, watches shit telly on his side eating biscuits, wanting to be left alone. That isolated Which character cruelly turns out to be fatal. Yeah, being closed off. Yeah. Anyway. It, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's tragic, isn't it, when you think of that. But then How many people have you killed? Carry on. <laughs> I've lost count. Um, but to see that character grow from someone who's sort of ignoring these feelings of grief and ignoring the past trauma to sort of embracing it and finding a coping mechanism to deal with it and tackle it head on. I thought he handled it so well and so believable. I thought everything, every inch of his performance was outstanding. There's, I've got no uh, criticism. On him. Yeah, superb. And I, I mean, I'm two, three episodes into Ripley and that scripting, you see a completely different side of him as an actor and I do highly recommend people watch that. You know, it's the first great. thing I saw him in, Band of Brothers. Yeah, it must have been he's, that first He's thing a new recruit around the third or fourth episode to fill in some of the losses and he's not, he's he plays a really quiet, again, really charming lad who's, you know, his heart's in the right place, but he's sort of rejected or hazed by the guys and then he gets killed. 
he's got that great balance between being like intense and being personable. Oh, Moriarty. Yeah, you see him and you're like, those eyes, they couldn't, if you wouldn't want to upset him, but also he, he's really relatable. I mean, he sounds like a great dude when he does podcasts and such. So yeah, mm. I just love the guy and I love him even more after watching this. He's exceptional. The other thing I loved about um, All of Us Strangers was the chemistry. When two actors anchor a film romantically, it is crucial that you buy into their relationship. I think that Paul Mescal's and Andrew Scott's dual performances were absolutely outstanding and the way they portrayed two lost souls finding comfort and compassion in one another, I mean, it really moved me. You can tell that there is a deep-rooted connection between the two off-screen as well as on camera and I think they both superbly negotiated a story that is raw, real and gut-wrenching. They did, but none of it actually happened. Yeah. Which is a dislike of mine, but I'm just sort of saying like that that stung. I wanted the love. I yeah, wanted it to happen. I know what you mean. I know. And I'll get onto that when we go into dislikes as well. I, I know exactly what you mean. You, I bought into that relationship. I loved that they, these two lonely, isolate, isolated characters found love when I thought, oh, well, at least they have each other. Mm. I was like, well, fucking you both fucking deserve it's it. It's a twix. It's a double tragedy. Yeah. Don't spit in my eye while I'm crying. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because then I cry your spit and that's just horrible. Cry your spit. You, you did it. You brought it up. Uh, lo- another thing I loved about the film is the eclectic exploration of emotions. Oof. All of Us Strangers takes its audience on a voyage of all the fills, and I, for one, was happy to have a ticket to the boat and a coupon for the buffet. Oh. Andrew Haig guides us through a really personal deep dive into grief, loneliness, self, acceptance, loss, closure, guilt, and so much more in a film that covers such a vast emotional landscape in a relatively short time. Nice. Now, the first time I watched it, I... I was moved. I was moved. I felt very anxious. So it, it evoked a lot of feelings, like you mentioned, relatability. I was on. I was on the edge of my seat. It, it was a lot. It was profound. I watched it yesterday again with my partner, with no making notes, just fully focused on the film. Second time round, it got me. It mm. hooked me. I cried, and I didn't the first. Do you time. remember what point? It was the dinner scene. The it was. Gift. It was, and the, it was the dad saying that he was proud, <sighs> and the and Andrew Scott's character going, "I've done." nothing to be proud of and like the fact that they turned around and said you kept going uh, that fucking got me i was like ah do you know where mine was jamie bell system i'm sorry i didn't come in your room when you were crying mm. and you'd get bullied at school yeah. and andrew scott goes to talk calmly and be very like oh don't worry it's not your f-. and then he takes an in breath and he just starts crying because yeah. that's how i cry i think i'm strong yeah up to a point and then rather than gradually cry it's like someone's punched me in the dick and i go <gasps> And then it all comes at once. Ugh, and I can't yeah. talk. Yeah, yeah. Oh. No, it's a very, very moving film. And I think it can be, it could be triggering, but on the on the flip side of that, it could also be healing. It I could think also healing. be beneficial if you've, if you're, if you've experienced loss or trauma or, or any of the really difficult human emotions, like digging deeper into a story that explores all of those things so extensively, I think it could help. I would love for my partner to watch it. Yeah. After losing both her parents really quickly, I would I would implore her to watch it when the time is right because there is elements to it that make me feel feel very warm and I was a bit like this is this is substantial filmmaking for people that have lost their parents. Well, especially if they've gone way too soon. I think trauma when you're amidst it is so alienating but watching it and realizing it's a shared experience and other people have lived it i think that can heal i think that can help like it can make you feel less isolated and more like you know there is help out there there's people that have experienced it and Mm -hmm. i'm not alone and i think that can only benefit because i see it i see it when i watch her sometimes like she looks alone in her eyes in her demeanor like there's things going on in her head where she feels totally alone. So watching the film was so realistic to me. Yeah. I was like, this film is so astoundingly similar to my life at the moment. Yeah. It was so weird. I mean, you you could just take the themes and you'd be able to relate to it, but then so, take yeah. the location, take the names. That's what I mean. The only thing, if I I mean, if I was a homosexual man, this film would be uncannily too similar. It yeah. would just be too much of my life. Yeah. I'd be like, someone is watching me. Yeah. I mean, the two leads, Adam and Harry, are two broken boys. No. Oh. I mean, we put an act on, we put masks on, but we're kind of broken boys. We, so there's a lot of... We have a lot of crying tears in pubs. It yeah. might be related to the 10 points. No, I don't think there's ever, ever been any <laughs> proven... <laughs> damaging things that alcohol does nah, nah it's yet. good for you yeah, yeah. Guinness, Guinness says it iron Guinness says it yeah 
says it. What didn't you like about All of Us Strangers? It's so close, man. So close. This film, for me, was en route. <laughs> Wait, is, it, is this a classic like and dislike? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. It, for me, it was en route to being a stone cold 10, especially at that dinner scene in the Wick Gift Centre. Up oh, until that point, I thought I'm watching probably one of the most profound films when it comes to how to handle the grief or loss of people, loss of your parents. I feel you deeply. But when it became a sort of a twist film, and uh, we, we talk spoilers in the Popcorn Kernel, so... I hope you've seen the film, but when it becomes a twist film and it turns out Paul Mascow's character, Harry is dead from the right after their first yeah. interaction. So all of the relationship, all of the going to clubs, doing drugs together, building an imaginary relationship on screen the whole time he was dead. It, it for me, it changed the film. I'm not saying I needed him to have a live happily ever after with Harry. It could have been open-ended in that regard, but the film's greatest message for me was him finding this weird imaginary sort of ghostly world where he can get closure with his dead parents. Yeah. And that was the really powerful part. And I thought Mescal is the younger uh, guy who's trying to bring him back into the world. Yeah. You can cry just as much at happy things as you can sad. And I just didn't like that aspect of the film. It didn't hit right. And it for me, it fucked me off because I was I was boning hard on this film i was yeah, like this yeah. this is exceptional i yeah it's exceptional and then i hate that twist i, I don't like it i'm right there with you like it would have been a lovely film that he's managed to connect with his parents he managed to get closure he could almost he might he'd have to say goodbye to them but at least he could say goodbye which he couldn't do when he was 12 that's what it was building that to. chapter closes and once that book's finished that chapter's finished the next mm. one he's got Harry there, Paul Mescal there to, to start his new journey of of, of exploring happiness instead mm. of being anchored down by grief. And then that twist as well. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'll tailgate if you'll allow, because that's my biggest dislike mm -hmm. was the twist. It's the twist itself meh, hit or miss for me. But what I didn't like is I saw the twist coming a mile off. This dislike may seem like a Trojan horse situation where I'm disguising my own self-indulgent praise as a dislike about the film. I can assure you tis not the case, good sir. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I got an idea of the narrative, I clocked that the relationship between Adam and Harry wasn't all that it seemed. Now, on first watch, I wasn't against the twist or anything like that. I think that may have changed on the second watch. Um, but if you serve up a film that is so emotionally gripping, so heartbreakingly engaging and so profoundly impactful and finish it off with an ending that I saw coming within the opening act, for me personally, that lessens my overall opinion. And after watching it yesterday, yesterday after hearing your thoughts and reflecting on it more, like what it, it was a the twist didn't add anything to it. It's not like a twist where you're you're watching and you're going, oh my God, I can't believe it went there. That's amazing. You're watching it going, I didn't need that. Like, I the film was ruined, beautiful. I think it ruined its potential. Yeah. It really did for me. I don't, uh, I, and this is this is true as well. So at the point in the film where say we're three quarters, almost, almost finished, uh, I, I message my partner. It's like midnight. Mm. And I send a lovely message saying, whenever you feel right, sit down and watch this movie. I think it can would do wonders for you. Yeah. Then the film, the twist happened. I deleted the message. Yeah, because it's, it's a different film. The then. last thing she needs to see is like this uh, obscured dead body that Andrew Scott finds at the end of a film that's just done some of the best, the best depictions of loss, and, and then top it off with an, another cherry dead on top. Yeah, top I was it like, off with oh, for off. fuck's sake! So I deleted the message. <laughs> yeah. she, she woke up. She was like, "What did you delete?" I went, "Don't worry about it." Yeah, don't worry. Don't you worry. You will never know unless you listen to this episode. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know we're on your dislikes, but I want to just jump on that with, with another one of mine. And it was that sniff of sixth sense. Mm. So much of all of us strangers worked for me. As I've already mentioned, the film, the performances, the messages, the exploration of emotions, the script, the direction, they all combined to make me think long and hard about this film for ages after the credits rolled. But I couldn't help but feel that it had more than a whiff of the sixth sense about it. 
I personally don't think Adam could communicate with the dead. I feel that we, what we see on screen is a visual representation of him coming to terms with his trauma and him exploring what things could have been like. This being said, there is an argument to be had that he could have actually been discussing details with the dead. Now, I hope that's wrong. I, I hope that I'm being cynical and incorrect, but this could almost be a film that is utilising the sixth sense format for a younger audience that haven't seen M. Night's original pop culture phenomenon. It blurs too much. When he takes Paul Mescal to go see his parents, who Paul Mescal knows are dead, and then Paul Mescal sees them in the mirror and moves back like, my God, what have I just seen? That's pure sixth sense. That's finding yeah. out you're dead as well. And I just thought, it's changed the whole narrative of the film it's exactly that i mean it, for the film in the film's favor is it's open-ended like you don't know if he can communicate with the deaf if this is him writing out everything because he's a writer and compartmentalizing and coming to terms with it that if it's just him like in his mind coming to terms with it figuring it all out so in the in defense of andrew haig he can go any which way well that's probably to do with the japanese novel Yes. I would say at the end of that book, you realise that he can communicate with ghosts or something. Very ring-like or something. I don't know, but yeah. I'd say it's to do with the source material. I just hope it isn't. I hope it isn't just a, an earlier Sixth Sense. And Sixth Sense isn't just an ad adaptation of those original source materials that we spoke to spoke about in the fact section. Because mm. if they have just tried to put another spin on Sixth Sense to target a younger audience that might not be aware of it, I, I hope it's not that. Where does this leave... The character Adam, though, after so alone again, he finds Naturally. a solution to moving on, has closure with spiritual mum and dad, just to then find a, a potential love interest dead from drug overdose or something in his room, choked on sick. Where does he? Where is he now? So now the character who I've saw grow throughout a film and get better and get more um, closure is now again in limbo. And I'm like, you've left it exactly how it started. Yeah, same as it ever was. Same as it ever was. Yeah. Watching the days go by. I can't help it. When you say Sad. line, I have to sing. I've got to get the sings out. So yeah, that that, that, that rocked me and really wound me up because that's how much I liked it. Yeah. Twitch. I, I mean, yeah, I, I was the same. Yeah. I just feel, and I, like I said, I did see it coming. I didn't know where, I didn't know the specifics, but I was like, that relationship isn't real. I think he might have been fantasizing and imagining a relationship. He's so lonely that he's an imagining a relationship with his attractive neighbor that lives down the hall. Well, I didn't know that it would be that, but I knew it was something. Did you notice he had a temperature throughout the film? Yeah. So when you have dream. a fever, hmm. your your imagination, your dreams are so surreal. The it worst. Could, could have been implying that all the fever is producing all of that. Like maybe he wasn't even getting on the trains. Maybe he was never leaving his house. There and is, all of this occurs in his head. There this is, is what I don't like. Yes, yeah, the open-endedness of it. Ugh. There is a chain of thought where uh, Adam, Andrew Scott's character, could be dead as well. And he's just communicating. I, there was, there was rumour of that. Um, the director has since said that it's not the case. He is alive. Well, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Though. I don't know if it is. Because he all he lives in isolation anyway, in a very depressing part of London. He's he's got writer's block. His brain is elsewhere. He can't he can't escape anything. He's so profoundly alone. Did they even take drugs? Probably not. Probably the the fever he's suffering from the deep depression, which can happen. You can die of a broken heart. That could have led into what we see as the film unfold. I think. Yeah. And I don't know. I think the work that went into making this amazing closure of his mum and dad who died way too young was too good to have gone spoil with a Shyamalan sort of esque ending. Yeah, I do agree with you, mate. Yeah. Third dislike. Uh, we covered it in Broke Back Mountain, but it's tragic that so many gay or LGBTQ people never get to tell their parents who they were, but it's a risky three sided coin. Could it be, you know, they could get disowned and rejected by their parents, which is the worst case. Uh, but I suppose the real prize is telling them you're gay and being welcomed and hugged and loved twice as more. That's like the holy land of acceptance. It's got to be. Like yeah. Adam, the character, lives in a world of loss and never being able to tell his parents that part of him was hidden. Like it must, it must be such a weird world to live in where, you know, you never got to tell them. That's mm. one part of the coin. You tell them and you get rejected, the worst one. And the third one, the, that's got to be the greatest form of acceptance, isn't it? Yeah. Being accepted and loved. That's got to be the, that's the goal. That's yeah. what everyone wants. That's, that's the, the fairy tale ending. And it's I just tragic. They have to go through the, this because of societal constraints or something. 
Yeah, that is, it is gut wrenching. And there is a world of difference between like saying, well, we don't mind and almost seeing indifferent mm. and being like, it doesn't it, like, we love you. We love you. Or we've always known we love you for, we love you for you. We couldn't care less. Like, see, that's the one that gets me. That's the one that would make me cry mm. because it's beautiful. I mean, I hope one day we just live in like live in a society where you don't even have to that phrase like come out. Imagine that. Like again, we we've touched on it uh, a few times. We never had to have that sort of that defining moment with our parents where we had to sit them down and worry and be like, what are they going to say? They, it's default setting. I think maybe two hundred, three hundred years, and it will be it's like androgynous. Like it wouldn't it wouldn't even, you it wouldn't even be questioned anymore. Yeah, I mean we. Do, it, in the in the ancient times, in the Greek times and Roman times, it wasn't even frowned at. It was no, like sex. It was it was bohemian. It didn't matter who you did it with. Yeah, it was like the sun's beer in Game of Thrones. He goes, "Pleasure's pleasure," or but, or Paul in Alien Paul. Yeah, you know, we you know we just we Vi- have fun. We fuck vibes is vibes. <laughs> vibes is vibes. Yeah, what are you gonna do? One day, maybe. Yeah, yeah. maybe we need a good two, three hundred years, or no more boulders. Yeah. Last dislike. Jamie Bell's freshly pulled tailored smoke is missing a quarter of tobacco at the end of the cigarette. Right. Do better. Right. Shut up and Do then better. speak more because I noticed that. And I was like, where's that tobacco? Yeah. I was like, I miss smoking. We've given up. I looked at that smoke. I was like, I want smoke. And I was like, and why is, why is that cigarette circumcised? Yeah. <laughs> where's the rest? Where's the rest of that back? Just stay, just, if you, if you can't show a real cigarette, just angle the camera so you don't see the end of this empty cigarette. Yeah. This stage smoke. Yeah, don't, don't, don't leave do the end of the tobacco out. I wonder if it was the same dude that made the synthetic jizz. He made the stage cigarette. Maybe all their budget went on the fake jism oh, yeah. and they couldn't afford to make the cigarettes look more realistic. A hot cross bun juice. We'll never know. I never know. That's my last dislike. Well, my last one is just it's bleak city central. As powerful, poignant and profound as all of us strangers is, it is almost two hours of pain, grief and struggle. Mm. Whilst the topics are handled beautifully, this is a film with very little to offer in terms of positive reinforcement. I enjoyed the journey, but I don't think I'll be looking to return to such a deeply sad story anytime soon. It's heavy. It's heavy, heavy film. And in terms of lighter moments of relief, there ain't many. You get a few glimpses of happiness when two very lonely people find some uh, connection, some companionship, some love with each other. But then that's pulled out from underneath you as well. So in terms of like happy feels, there's fuck all. Which, you know, sucks. I mean, there's there's bittersweet stuff with him getting to, to say goodbye and speak with his parents. That's nice. That's healing and stuff. But the, the film doesn't end on a happy note. I guess the, the the most positive thing is he's got that closure. He feels a little bit more rounded because he's been able to navigate the choppy waves of grief and trauma a little bit. Well, he's better. got closure on one door and then another one opens. Yeah. So now he, if there was a sequel, it would be him reminiscing about why he didn't let Paul Mescal into his house. Imagine that. Able to finally better manage the grief of losing both your parents as a child and then opening a door to, oh, if I let that man into my home and had a drink, he would still be alive. The film sort of says there's no hope. Yeah. And I think that's a hard pill to swallow. It is, especially when real life feels like there's no hope. Anyway, I've got some questions. Mm. All of Us Strangers focuses on Adam and Harry. Our names are Adam and Harry. Mm. In a film about our relationship, who would you choose to play us? Oh, well, I, I've said to you, <laughs> it's nothing to do with your chin. Oh, here we go. You used to have a much more pronounced chin when we first met. I was in, a lot in, slimmer. That's in the why super, the chin extended. In, yeah, it was supermarket day and it was clean shaven. You just had this huge chin. But anyway, <laughs> my brother pointed out once that you look like Gregory Sporleader, who was in The Rock. He's one of the bad guys in The Rock. Of course he is. And it's just, it's it's the face. It's chin inspiration. It's chin inspiration, and it, you look like him. But he's actually he plays a really good sort of devious bad guy. Uh, myself, I've been told when I was younger and had good dark hair, good head, hairline, and uh, quite nice eyes. Like I was, I looked like Rufus Sewell or Sewell. I, I Rufus Sewell. Sure, that's it. Oh, that's nice. From uh, the Knight's Tale, you and... get a stunning blue-eyed, black-haired thespian, and I get a criminal chin. It's just based on looks. Thanks, mate. I can't do it on personality, otherwise you'd be uh, Upham from Private Ryan, the guy who's in God of War, plays a twitchy, nervous dude in oh, everything. Brill- oh, so you're either an evil chin or a fucking Jeremy mess Davis. of a man. Jeremy Davis. Fantastic. Thank yeah. you for that, mate. Well, what do you prefer? Gregory Sporley because of the chin or Jeremy Davis, is it? 
Oh, it's like asking, would you rather have diarrhea or vomiting? Either. Well, who would you who would you put for me? Rufus Shul. Oh. Always said it. <laughs> Nice one. I'll give you a nice little boost. No, that's fine, mate. I'll go and cry later. No. Andrew Scott and Paul Mescal are phenomenal in All of Us Strangers. The two have undeniable chemistry and work really well together. What sort of film would you like to see them collaborate on next? Oh, it, is Mescal Irish as well? Aye. I think he is, isn't he? Aye. Oh, it's got to be an IRA film then, during the struggles or something. Maybe one's a Republican and one's a Unionist. Oh, so against each other. Well, they could either start out as friends when they're young and parents are saying don't mingle with that kid, he's Catholic or Protestant, yeah. etc. And then they decide to anyway, but then maybe the troubles then kick off and they find themselves in the, you know, paramilitary of each side and then they f- fight or saying, or, yeah, something IRA. I think that would be interesting. Wind that shakes the barley-esque. Yeah. Something like that. I uh, I heard in, a, in, in an Empire interview that they said they wanted to do a Thelma and Louise type crime film next. And I wouldn't mind seeing them in something like that. Two, they, they like Lovers to be or two, mates. No, like bandits, vagabonds, fuck the system sort of sort of um, characters. And I'd, I'd quite like to see that. They <laughs> sold that to me when I listened to the podcast. So that is what I want to see them in. Like Hell or High Water. Yeah. Which actor's parents would you like to meet? And which director's childhood home would you like to visit? Oh, d- director's home's got to be Wes Anderson. I've got to see that room. If it's not... Like the film, OCD, aesthetically pleasing, city central, I think I'd have to physically strike him. Well, I imagine it, like he would sit at his dinner table and he'd be looking at the carpet and all of the patterns in it. Mm. And then he'd be looking at a cabinet and making sure that the patterns are in line with the cabinet and stuff. I, I, well, how I'm fascinating to see the world he grew up in because if because he's such a visionary director, the way he looks at things. I would, I hope, I deeply hope that that his eye for stuff mirrors his real life. You can't top it. And think of a director visually. No, there's no one. I mean, there's many that try and fail to do what he does, but in terms of the palette, in terms of the s- symmetry, in terms of the I ratios, mean, like the, his house. Director's house. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Is it the director's house or his parents' house where he grew up? Uh, so it'd be his childhood home. Yeah, exactly. Oh, so he, yeah, he must have got influence from... He must have. Yeah. He must have. That's a good answer. I remember one musician saying once, like, he he always knew he was going to be a musician. He said he remembered, like, working in an office and he would find song in the printer. He would hear the printer going... It's a tune. And he would sit there and go... He'd start getting the beat going so i reckon anderson yeah i reckon he was in his house when he was young and he would look at lines and look at shapes and stuff oh that's a great answer yeah and the actor what actor's parents would you like to meet goslin well of course i'd like to see if they have if they've managed to also have cl- close eye syndrome and still look good looking yeah i'd like to see that do you want to explain close eye syndrome to the listener if they don't know what it is it's just where your eyes are closer to your nose and there's a lot of s- face space left because your eyes are really close friends a lot of face space i mean he pulls it off yeah he does he pulls it off some people can't pull it off no some people can't do it no um i'd like to meet shia labeouf's parents after seeing honey boy i've heard like they like forced him into stardom especially the dad so i'd be interested to see to meet them and say have you seen honey boy are you really that much of a dickhead you owe your son an apology because he's quite fucked up because of you so i'd like to meet them uh and the director's childhood home you know the answer tarantino of course yeah as i'm reading about his love of cinema in his book cinema speculation there's a plug for you uncle quentin i just love to i know about how he grew up and how his like love of cinema was formed and how it grew and blossomed so i'd love to to go and see his childhood home and just just talk to his parents Mm-hmm. Just sounds cool. What would you rate all of us strangers out of ten? Seven point five. Yeah, but I yeah, I did as well. It, the dog was probably a nine point five ten. Yeah, it really was. I think the the um, dislikes we mentioned are are quite heavy dislikes that pulled it down. I mean, after my first watch, it was a bit less. It did go up a bit after watching it again. It really, for whatever reason, it moved me a lot more on the second time round. Mm. I think if that twist wasn't there, and if maybe that one chapter closed and another opened, where we see two characters that you grow to love, and you sort of appreciate that they've they've cured their loneliness by finding each other i think it would have been a much higher score maybe i, I may, maybe even an 8.5 or 9 mm. but because of that yeah i dropped it down to a 7.5 as well maybe you were subconsciously shedding a tear on behalf of people you care about 
Maybe. Potentially. Maybe. Like, it can happen. Yeah. You put yourself in someone else's shoes, it can make you shed a tear. Maybe I do have a heart after all. Mm. That gives all of us strangers a total score of 15 out of 20. If you like your films to be heartbreaking, head scratching and hurt healing, or if you've ever wanted to see Andrew Scott go through a hell of a lot, then All of Us Strangers could be a film for you. All of Us Strangers is available to stream on Disney+. Plus. Consider watching this one if you enjoyed After Sun, The Eternal Daughter and The Lake House. Should we play a game? Give it a name, give it a name, give it a name now. We birth a plot and then make a trailer. What the plot? Action! A man is on his way to a solo break in the countryside. During his journey, a storm stops him in his tracks and he has no choice but to take shelter in an isolated pub in the middle of nowhere. (laughs) The pub is about to close, but the landlord is a kind man and lets our stranded traveller stay in the pub for the night. The storm continues into the next day and once the compassionate landlord realises the treacherous weather is here to stay, he phones our traveller and tells him that he is free to remain in the pub until the storm finally passes. The landlord asks our protagonist to keep an eye on things at the pub during the storm and in return allows our main character to stay there free of charge. The landlord tells our pub babysitter that he will return as soon as the weather allows him to make the short drive from his home to the pub he owns. He informs our reined-in pub dweller that he can help himself to food and, more importantly, drink. This then becomes a single setting film. We soon discover that this travelling man is a recovering alcoholic who has been sober for 10 years. The reason our lead man is getting away is because he has nearly relapsed several times recently. The film sees this ex-addict navigate the temptation of being alone with access to all kinds of alcohol. His only company? A hallucination of his drunk self who keeps trying to to encourage him to have a drink. Whoa. That's cool. That's almost like a stage play, like a one-man show. Yeah. I could imagine that. Is it set like in the country, did you say? Yeah. In countryside somewhere, a dealer's choice in sort of time frame. It could be later. It could be a little while back so it's not phones not as easy to find a somewhere to stay or or whatever so you don't have the you don't have the mm, yes. access yeah it's sort of like in the time of Wiffnor and I yeah kind of and he's just out in the middle of nowhere and he can't stay in his car it's like a really bad storm so he gets to stay in a pub and then he's stuck there do you know what, in my brain, I'm f- every time you do a What the Plot, I'm only ever constantly trying to think of the title immediately. Yes, yeah, I hard. always put casting and directing last because I want to get the name right. Because I used it. to say to myself, like, Adam's entitled some awful films. Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? And then I, and I always pri- prized myself in potentially getting the And fuck me, that's all I'm thinking about. I'm sitting here and I was thinking of some sort of Heathcliff Moreland sort of thing going on. And then you said that he has an alcohol dependency. But sober for 10 years, but now he's alone with alcohol and he's nearly relapsed loads and he's got that little devil on his shoulder, a.k.a. drunk him going, go on, go on. I'd definitely, I'd have Edgar Wright direct. Oh, interesting. I mean, I think of the Winchester in, <laughs> in Sean of Death and I think of like, because he's good at dark comedies. So they're always a little bit more, uh, you know, funnier. Yeah. But I, I think he could do something maybe with a bit more of a darker undertone. I like that. I, I had a name in mind. I, I thought Martin McDonough, but then that'd be a bit on the nose. I think Done I, it. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. very obvious with the Banshees and the Bruges. I thought I'd try to give someone else a different a different run for their money. And an actor who I'm really enjoying at the moment, and even though you say pub, you say country, it's very, it's, you know, it's English, but this guy could have flown over from the States to get away from his usual haunts to see if a change of scenery could change yeah. his addiction. He could have been living in England for 10 years. Me me wants to t- give to the Jesse Plem. Oh, hello, good sir. That is exceptional. I think he could play a duality. I think he could be bipolar in a, in a, in a film. Because I was saying to you recently, he plays villain as good as he plays good guy. He could, he's so like he plays a really heartwarming good guy in Fargo. He plays uh, a nasty 
bastard in Breaking Bad. He, you know, he's he's got he can play both sides of it. He's got layers. He has. And got I layers. tell you what, when we first see the drunken hallucination of Jesse Plemons, he could be really charismatic and charming, life and soul of the party. And then as the more time goes, and as he doesn't get his sober self to drink, you could see him turn it and become quite nasty mm. and like trying to force him to drink by being saying about his insecurities and being really horrible to himself. I like that. I think he'd be superb. Oh, title, man. I want to have like a play on words with escape, but not to freedom, like escape to prison or something or, or um, something to do with where he believed he'd be free of it. He's actually still imprisoned from it. What could that be? Something like internalized retreat to relapse retreat to relapse it's, it's, it's see this is where i struggle because that's too literal yeah and i like always like to put an artistic spin on things but that's when i go blank because it's, it's on the spot i'm so happy that we live in a world in season two where you feel my my struggle because it is hard to do to do the what the plot oh i might have it i might have it oh the the glass boat yep the glass boat because that shit don't float, but it's a boat which represents escape, freedom, and glass, alcohol in a glass. Fuck yeah, you did well. You added that bit. Yeah, that yeah. was just a coincidence. To tie it all up in a lovely package, Dad. So I'm gonna Edgar Wright direct a little change, uh, a little tone down in the comedy, an uplift in the darkness. So Jesse Plemons playing a dual character on his own in a bar where he's trying to escape alcohol, but really trying to escape himself, and I'd call it the glass boat. From acclaimed director, Edgar Wright. Okay, I think that's everything. Heating, plumbing, food, drink. That's everything. Stay safe. See you when the storm dies down. Comes a film where the lines between relapse and retreat are blurred. (laughs) Well, well, well. You thought you got rid of me, didn't you? You're just a bottle, you're just a bottle, you do not control me. I can do this, I can do this. Oh look, a sandwich. I can eat something, eat something. Nah, you don't want to eat something. You want to drink something. Re- remember the times we had together, we had a laugh. No, no, no yes. No, I don't. I don't remember. I don't remember. I can't taste it. You, you, you remember it. You loved it. You love me. You're nothing without me. Get out of my like, head. No, I've Get out always... of my head. Oh, you've always, I've always been your head man. The thing is with you is... Not all ships are meant to sail. The glass boat. Coming soon.